So, mistakes are portals of discovery. So it's a famous quote by James Joyce. What I will share to you today is how I came to realize that mistakes are great opportunities to make ourselves better people. Personally, I was afraid of mistakes. I was afraid of committing and admitting mistakes. I believe we all are. But as I came to see mistakes for what they really are opportunities, I was also able to see a different reality, richer and more open reality opening up for me, and I, could, I was able to connect with it more easily. This hugely improved my work. I am a researcher, and I research how and why people mobilize in authoritarian countries, so in political systems that strongly discourage them from doing so. My work focuses on the Middle East, so uh, because of war and conflict plaguing the region, I've often found myself working with displaced migrants, political refugees, asylum seekers from Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, and Iran. Research is a human endeavor, and as such, it is full of mistakes, it is limited. But this is the beauty of research. If we recognize mistakes, we are always able to go back to what we have done and improve how we do it and what we discover. So mistakes improve my work, but also, crucially, improve myself as a person. You see, when you work with people, with actual individuals as I do, who have intellectual imaginations, who have feelings, it is very difficult to distinguish between yourself as a professional researcher, so your professional persona, and yourself as a simple human being. So improving my work is improving myself, and mistakes are, cru are, are crucial to both. I've always been in solidarity with the people I work with, However, the way in which I extended my solidarity hasn't always been good. Although I had no bad intention, at times I made people feel uncomfortable. Sometimes my actions reflected well-entrenched stereotypes. There is a famous essay written by a famous scholar, a black feminist and lesbian scholar. Her name is Audre Lorde which is titled, The Master's Tools Will Never Dismantle the Master's House. What Audre Lorde wanted to share with us is that if we really want to change society and build a better world, we better confront seriously what we do wrong, especially if we mean well. Last November, I was working as a volunteer at the City Plaza Hotel in Athens, an empty hotel that was occupied a couple of years ago by undocumented migrants, uh, political refugees, um, asylum seekers, but also Greek people badly hit by the austerity economy. One day, I was doing my shift at the bar with another international volunteer, and these two teenage boys came to us and asked for two glasses of water. So I filled up the glasses and handled the glasses out to the two boys, and I said to the one, to the one who had remained silent, is this for you? And he looked at me in silence. So I insisted, is this for you? His friend then jumped in and said to me, you know, we're from Syria, and one year ago, while he was asleep, a bomb blasted just next to his house. And because of the shock, he never said a word again. So I gasped, and I, but I was puzzled. I was puzzled because I actually remembered talking to him, and I somehow remembered his voice. But I also said to myself that bombs and traumas are an actual thing in Syria, so I better apologize for insisting, which I did straight away. The other international volunteer just next to me also mumbled a few words of sadness. And as we did that, the two boys erupted in laughter. And the, dumb, the silent one looked at me with mixed contempt and, and fun. It was a joke. That joke revealed a lot about myself. It revealed the fact that I trusted stereotypes about war and traumatized kids in Syria more than my own memory. I was so used to hear stories about traumas from Syria that I never thought that asylum seekers and refugees could actually joke about something, something like that. But more than this, I never thought that my good intention, my willingness to care and help, were actually could be, turn, could be turned into a joke. While we want to help people, at times, we may end up disconnecting from them. And we may end up replacing real people with stereotypes we're just more familiar with. At other times, I made people feel helpless and incapable. Between 2010 and 2014, I've often traveled to Turkey to work with refugees from Iran. So one day, I was in a taxi with a friend, and we were going to the local UN office. 
As the taxi reached the office and stopped, my friend insisted on paying. So I insisted again, and he insisted again. So we went on for a couple of minutes until I said, stop it, I'll take this, you are a refugee. And voila, another stereotype revealed. Refugees must be poor, right? So I wanted to be sound and sensible, but I did end up offending my friend. This episode tells a lot about the hierarchies I've been familiarized with since early childhood. I am a white woman, I am a white European citizen, and you know, I am the well-off one, I am the rich one. They're not, they're not white, they're not European, and they must be poor, they are poor. My insistence on pain was about reassuring myself that those hierarchies I was brought up with were actually correct, but I was actually wrong. Often, this kind of reassurances have a gender dimension. In 2012, after a major earthquake, I was touring Southeast Turkey to shoot a documentary with a friend um, about the living condition of uh, migrants, and we were, um, we were traveling with a group of American activists who were staging a theatrical performance to protest against the fact that migrants were still living in tents with no governmental aid. So one day we arrived in a tent camp and a fellow activist and myself entered the tent and invited the five Afghan women we found inside to out to join the protest. After a few seconds of silence, uh, one of them said in English, well, you know, we can't, we do not have the permission to leave the tent when our husbands are not around. So my American friend looked at me with, I would say, pity for those women and left. I stayed in the tent, and the same woman said, this time in Persian, to, to her friends, come on, I would die of embarrassment to be the mother of one of those Americans, meaning that she found the protest very ridiculous, and this is why she didn't want, they didn't want to join. This encounter speaks to the... So that woman was actually playing with gender stereotypes depicting Muslim women as obedient and subservient to their husbands. She knew that we, the Western women, would have not challenged that stereotype. Later on, I joined my American friend who said to me that she felt very sorry for those women who are so badly oppressed. So this encounter speaks to the fact that sometimes um, we may not feel the need to learn real things about the people we want to help. Sometimes we just content ourselves with assuming that we know who they are, what they think, what they need, and what they want. Another example, uh, while I was in City Plaza Hotel in Athens, I used instinctively to approach everybody by speaking in Persian. In fact, many of the residents are from Iran and Afghanistan, so they do understand me. However, some Kurds from Iran felt offended because to them Persian is a colonial language that they had to learn at the expenses of what they considered to be their mother tongue, which is Kurdish. But I never thought about the implication of speaking Persian to unknown people. I just thought that, well, I have Persian and that's great, so I can communicate more easily with people, and that somehow this, to a certain extent, uh, excuse my tactlessness, and at the end of the day, I was there to help, so this, to a certain degree, was enough to be liked by other people. Why didn't I feel compelled to learn about how my presence made the people living in City Plaza Hotel feel? Why was I assuming that my presence, because I was there to help, right? Why was I assuming that my presence was welcome, and what is solidarity then? The answer to all these questions is that we, I should have moved away from a paradigm of service entirely. You see, the root of most problems with volunteerism is the orientation to the relationships involved. This means echoing Lord's Lord that I was mentioning at the beginning. This means that unless we are willing to, to seriously confront and to seriously question the way in which we, est we establish a relationship with partners and friends on the ground, we may end up building relationships that reproduce stereotype, cause cultural degradation, or simply strengthen imbalance and unevenness. And when it comes to the relationships I was building, this means that a radical U-turn was needed. So I kind of took a step back and I, started, and I started to stop thinking about others, who people who actually needed my help, and I also started 
um, stopped thinking about, about them as my activist cause and started to seriously reflect on the fact that my ability to build a better world and my ability to imagine political alternatives to the status quo was actually bounded to the political liberations of others around me. So from this perspective, I was the one in need for their help. So let's go back to City Plaza Hotel in Athens. The occupation is about to turn one and a half year old, and everybody is busy with preparing the big party uh, to celebrate the event on that very night. So we have food, we have dances, uh, we have music, everything is ready, and we are all gathered in the main hall of the hotel. One of the residents at a certain point shouted, I love you all, and everybody cheered up. Uh, City Plaza changed my life, he went on, thanks to us, thanks to the refugees for occupying, for occupying City Plaza. These words are important, and they speak to the fact that the people who occupied City Plaza Hotel did so in the first place to provide a safe and dignified life for themselves and the people they love. Not only migrants occupied City Plaza Hotel, not only migrants did it, also, Greek people suffering from economic austerity took part in the occupation, organized it, and still live there. We live together, we learn together, we struggle together, is the motto of the City Plaza Hotel. And it is about establishing new ways of living together, which are alternative to economic austerity, which are alternative to isolation and to an impoverished society but which are also alternative to the spatial segregation of migrants who end up living in centers that look more like prisons than shelters, and to the cultural segregation of migrants, whose aspiration apparently must be limited to cultural assimilation rather than exchange and mutual enrichment. To revitalize our aspiration of what humanity is capable of, it is mandatory that we transcend hierarchies of worthiness between national and racial identity. In this sense, solidarity looks more like a journey alongside others instead of a charity act. In a time of normalized racism and authoritarian nostalgia, and I am originally from Italy, so if you have seen the electoral results a couple of days ago, so you know what I'm talking about. So in a time of normalized racism and authoritarian nostalgia, it is vital to protect alternative political imaginations. Be the mistake then, be the ones who commit mistakes in your group of friends, in your family, in your classroom, university, in your society. And while you do that, ask yourselves, what am I missing? Then the portals of discovery and future will open up for you. Thank you very much.